I'm speaking with David Kirkpatrick, the author of The Facebook Effect. David, given where Facebook is today, almost seven years old, half a billion members, more than a billion in revenue expected at the end of the year, 1,400 employees. When is this company going to go public? Does Mark, you've spent a year with him, more than a year with him, does he, what's his thoughts on going public? He doesn't want to do it. I mean, one of the oddities about Facebook is that Mark, through the course of the company's development, acquired absolute, total, complete control, which all the entrepreneurs who listen and watch your show wish they had, because it's very, very rare. Uh, and because of that, he does what he wants to do. The VCs cannot tell him what to do. He controls three out of five board seats. So that's one of the real lessons, by the way, for entrepreneurs, is how he got that control. That's pretty amazing. Um, but so the fact is he does not want to be second-guessed, and he doesn't really want to be pushed to monetize and push advertising too hard too fast. So I think he's very concerned that if he goes public, he's going to have Wall Street breathing down his neck, and they're never going to come close to taking the same kind of long-term view he does. I mean, this seems irrelevant, but the vision that he has for the company is literally for everyone on the planet to use it. And he feels anything that impedes his continued movement towards ubiquity, towards everyone using Facebook, is a way of missing the opportunity that's on the, that, that it's available to them and, and possibly allowing someone else to get that opportunity because he really believes a system will emerge that everybody uses. They want to be that system for social connectivity, right, and to bring social life to everything. So if that's it, he knows Wall Street is going to say, wait a minute, let's pull some cash out of this thing, you know, this year, this quarter. You know, what's a, this quarter made life for? He doesn't want to get into that kind of a cycle at all. He may be forced to. He's already got a two-class stock structure, a two-class stock structure that allows, you know, him to maintain substantial control even if there is a public offering, because the you know the class A shares will have 10x voting of the class B shares, or vice versa. I forget which it is, but um, he also has never really even sought. So to say, he's been offered, you know, 10 million, 75 million, 500 million, 750 million, 1 billion, 15 billion for the company over the company's first three years. He turned down all of them without even thinking about it. Right. Who was the first one? Was it? Viagra? First one was an unknown uh, entrepreneur in Manhattan in May of 2004. 10 million. He was still a sophomore in college. Could have taken 10 million out. Stayed in school. And what were the other ones? Oh uh, well, there's uh, Viacom twice, MTV and Viacom twice, uh, Yahoo. First they were 75 million. Then they came back at 750 million plus a earnout that probably would have doubled the total if they'd performed properly. Then. Not too long after that, Yahoo came with a billion. They almost took that because they thought maybe their growth had topped out. Uh, but they didn't because it turned out it hadn't. Oh, that was uh, 06. Yeah. Summer, fall, 06. Summer, early fall, 06. And then Microsoft in the fall of 07, Steve Ballmer offered Zuckerberg $15 billion cash for the company. He's 23 years old. He would have taken out $5 billion himself, and he didn't even consider accepting it. So what about the other investors? The bigger, the, the people who've been with Mark who... Yeah, well, Excel still owns like 10% of the company. Um, and Jim Breyer owns 1% himself, personally. Um, has, the tension been, has there been tension there in terms of... I don't think there's been much tension. I don't think there's been as much tension as you might expect. And it's because however much exit people might have wanted, they have seen the valuation grow so consistently and rapidly Think about how, why second market has been so helpful. Well, certainly, certainly there's, there, there, is a, there is an escape valve available for any investor in Facebook because you can trade their shares on private markets like second market or shares post uh, or just privately. And if you have – Facebook has the right of first refusal on those transactions in almost every case. But you can sell. And many of employees do. A lot of employees are leaving. A lot of investors have sold. The VCs in general have not. Excel has not to any substantial degree, if at all. They may. Well, Peter Thiel know. sold a lot of his shares. Uh, he sold, I estimate, as much as almost half his shares. Uh, but he only put in 500000 first for 10% of the company. Right. I said that may be the all-time greatest investment in history. Right, right. Because his, you know, that, that's a multi-billion dollar 
return on a half million dollar investment. I mean, come on. Incredible. Why isn't that still selling? Because they think it's going to get more valuable later. That's the simple answer. Maybe the biggest IPO ever once they decide it's going to. If they had an IPO, I'm quite certain it would be the biggest IPO ever. I think they could go public today at a valuation of $50 billion if they wanted to. The demand is amazing. And this is something most people don't realize, and I've learned a little bit about this from talking to some of the markets and stuff. Basically, every investment group in the world wants to be able to tell their limited partners and their investors that they own Facebook. So there's almost no upper bound to what people are willing to pay. So every, people just want the bragging rights to say, I'm in Facebook, right? So that's why the valuation's gone to $27 billion, just like in the last year from maybe $5 billion. Market. Second market is currently trading at around $27 billion. What, what about this lawsuit? Now, I know you're one of the only reports, if, if the only reporter who's spoken with this, uh, Paul Seglia, who... I didn't speak to Seglia. I spoke okay. to his lawyer, and it was background only, so I can only say too much. I can't say much about it, but I did talk to the he lawyer. He claims that he owns 85% of Facebook today mm -hmm. because right. he was given 50% back in 2004 for fa the Facebook and it sounds like, I mean, everyone's picking it up. The media's picking it up. Is there any merit to this? this it does. Certainly there's no fundamental merit to it. Uh, but, but Mark might have made a very stupid mistake and signed an overly general contract in exchange for $1,000, which sounds to me very unlikely. Because it wasn't like enough money to sign away half of anything, really. Uh, $1,000, and then this guy disappeared for seven years, completely absent, and suddenly appears out of nowhere and says, I own 84% of the company. That's ridiculous. But it may, I think the document's probably fraudulent. That's my guess. If it isn't, however, they will settle. That's just the way these things happen. It'll probably be, you know, a few million, and this guy will be rich, and he'll be happy. He hit the lat lottery, you know. And he'll go away because all you know he didn't do anything to make Facebook. He gave Mark a thousand dollars a year before Facebook was started, and the contract is weird because it says, according to them, for the Facebook, which was a yearbook. It was described as a yearbook. That's not what Facebook was. I think they could have a big problem in court if they took it to trial demonstrating that even the investment was in the thing that Facebook later became. Just because it had a similar name doesn't mean that it is what became Facebook, sure. which was not a yearbook in any way. Sure. Okay, David, we're going to talk about, uh, in our next segment, Google versus Facebook. That's going to be exciting. Who wins? <laughs> yes, Who's better it's an interesting topic. Okay. David Kirkpatrick, sit around. Uh, stick around.